Previously, we saw an example of how to test whether a process was wide sense stationary or not. Now we're going to look at the power spectral density. And I'm going to give you the sketch of an example of how you would go about calculating the power spectral density for a random process. I won't go through all the details, but I'll give you at least a flavor for what it's like uh, to find a power spectral density. So the power spectral density is the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function. And wide set, uh, and it's only really defined for wide sense stationary random processes. Because a wide sense stationary random process has an autocorrelation function which of a single variable. So when I have a single variable, I can take the Fourier transform and get something which is a function of a single variable, a single frequency. So power spectral density, well-defined for wide sense stationary processes. I'm going to give you, like I said, a quick example. And this quick example is going to be a random binary signal. So we can think of data that's being transmitted as being uh, well-modeled as being random. Um, we can, in this case, the example I'm going to take is for a rectangular non-return to zero uh, example. So very simple form to the bits that are being transmitted, and we're modeling the bits to be uh, random. Uh, so here we go. So let's look at this uh, binary sequence. So it has value is 0. Logic uh, 0 is 0 volts. Uh, excuse me. Logic 0 is minus 1 volts and logic 1 is plus 1 volts. And we're sending it for a certain interval of time, which is t, the bit time. And here you see this rectangular function, and it's non-return to zero, so it just stays uh, at whatever value it is for the duration of the bit. Now, we're modeling this as a random binary sequence, which means that here it's taking the value of logic 1, logic 1, uh, logic 0, etc. Now, because I've chosen to make it plus 1 and minus 1 volts, uh, you know that the average time average is going to be uh, zero because it's random. Half the time it's plus one, half the time it's minus one. Uh, so the DC value uh, is clearly uh, zero. Now, if I want to um, uh, do this analysis, the first assumption I'm going to make is that not only is it random, but they're independent. Um, so the data is independent. The probability of having a logic 1 following a logic 1, well, it's completely independent. Each time I have a bit to send, doesn't matter what the previous one was. Um, so I like to, um, okay, we'll leave it at that. It's, it's, it's random and it's independent from one bit to the next. So that's our assumption that we're going to exploit when we calculate the autocorrelation function for this. So the autocorrelation function, uh, what am I going to do? I'm going to take that function and I'm going to slide it a certain amount of time. Uh, there's time t, and then I'm going to slide it, and I'm going to call the first slide to be sort of tau 1. Tau 1, I slide it a little bit to the right. And I'm going to calculate the autocorrelation function, and of course I need the autocorrelation function no matter uh, how, how much I slide it. So I'm going to have to, to do this more than once. So what is the... Um, uh, definition of the uh, function. Well, we know it's normally it's a function of where I am absolutely. But I, I'm not going to go through the math because it's, it's, it's a little tedious, but I think it's quite intuitive that by symmetry, you know, this is just these rectangles, and by the independence, the data is independent from one to the next, that it, it doesn't really matter if this is Tuesday or Friday or whenever I'm sliding it, I'm always seeing the same thing. It's going to matter how much I slide it, for sure. But, you know, whether I'm at a point where it's plus, plus, minus, plus, plus, minus, 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 plus, plus, doesn't really matter. Okay, so I think that this is intuitively clear. So I'm not going to, uh, I'm just going to concentrate on this lag <laughs> and how big is this lag. Because how big this lag is will change uh, the results of our calculation. So let's start with the example case one where this, this lag is bigger than the time of one bit. Okay, so here's my, my distance, and it's bigger than this time of one bit. It's something larger. I don't, I don't care how much larger, but it's larger. So I had this sequence, and it was bit zero, followed by bit one, followed by bit two, and it goes on forever. And now here, there's some other bits because I slid them, but there's a time where I get to B0 again, B1, B2. 
Now I'm going to have to find the autocorrelation function, and that means I have to take the expected value of the product of these two, right? Here's the random process. Here's the same random process, but now uh, with the lag. So I have uh, x of t up here on top, and then I have x of t minus tau here, and so what do I do? I have to take the expected value of this product. So uh, when I take the expected value of this, uh, then I'm going to have to multiply these numbers together. Now, let's think about the multiplication now. I have bit 0, and it's going to be multiplied by something, some bit minus 3, minus 4, minus 5, doesn't matter, something because this tau is going to change. But it's going to be multiplying it by a bit that is not itself, right? It's some other bit, because itself is later on. So I know that I'm not going to be um, multiplying a bit by itself uh, during this. Th th that was the whole point of making this assumption. That's why I made this case 1. So now if it's not um, multiplying by itself, I can look at what is the expected value that I'm going to be, pro I'm going to be calculating here. So I'm going to have bit 1 times bit 0, for instance. This is a little bit larger than, than t. Um, and I know what is the expected value of these? Well, they're independent, right? So the expected value of b0 times b1, well, it's just the expected value of b0 times the expected value of b1, because I assume they were independent. And what is the expected value of each one? Well, it's just 0, because equally likely plus and minus 1, the, the mean is 0. So I'm 0, I'm going to get 0. So any time I multiply a bit by something that is not the exact same bit, any other bit, doesn't matter how they're lagged, doesn't matter if 0, 1, 0, and 77, you know, whatever it is, I'm going to get 0. I'm going to get 0 times 0. So that means that for tau greater than t, the expected value of the product, that is the autocorrelation function, is going to be 0. And I can just go through, even if I have an infinite length uh, signal, infinite number of bits, the product is every interval of time is always going to give me this contribution of 0. So conclusion, for case tau greater than t, the expected value of the product is just 0. Now let's move on to case 2. And the case 2 is a little more complicated. So now we assume that this lag is actually less than the time of a single bit. So now this t1 example, uh, this lag is less than the, the time of one bit. And so now when I'm um, multiplying, well, it'll be kind of like the previous case because when I'm looking at an interval of a certain width, I'm going to get 0. Same exact situation as previously, a b0 by, in this case, uh, b minus 1. But for a certain amount of the time, I'm going to get something that's the same. So from tau to t, so this interval here, that tau to t, I'm actually going to be multiplying b0 times b0, right? Uh, in this case, I'm not going to get um, uh, independence of the bits. They're not independent because they're two different bits. So I'm going to get a different result. So the greater tau, the larger this tau is, that, that region of overlap is going to be smaller and smaller. So when tau is like zero, I've got a full T, capital T, that is overlapping. But as I get um, tau gets bigger, then it's a smaller and smaller percentage of the bit interval where I overlap and therefore the autocorrelation should go down, right? So if I just take this without having to go through the integral because it's just, I want to do a quick example. You can imagine that the peak happens when they're completely overlapping. So now when I get the um, uh, product, it's going to be 1 because it'll be either a 1 times 1 or a 1 times minus 1, of course, multiplied by the duration t. So that'll be the maximum. And as tau gets bigger, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller until I get to the t. In that case, there's no more overlap. And I get back to the situation where it's 0. So that shows me that the result of the autocorrelation function should be that it's something that's triangular. It's triangular and um, 
uh, the ex expression for this triangle is exactly equal uh, to what's given here, that when tau is smaller than t, it's equal to 1 minus, and then it's the absolute value of tau, um, divided by t. So now I've got this um, nice triangular function for the autocorrelation function, and if I wanted to find the power spectral density, well, all I need to do is find the Fourier transform pair. And of course, for a triangle, we know that the Fourier transform is just the um, sinc squared function. And hence, the sinc squared function was the example we saw in our uh, bandwidth calculations, because it comes up uh, uh, quite often in our theory. So here is the uh, sinc function squared, which is our power spectral density. And if we integrate the um, sinc function squared, we can come up with the area under the curve, and that will, of course, give us the total uh, average power uh, for our, our signal.